Would you like to pair with me? Because I am going to pair with you. Okay. Do you want to go first? I'm going to say something nice to try to laugh. Okay. Okay. We have one that's just going to and that's good. Hello. Hi, 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 <laughs> Except for, I did that last week for staff appreciation because I was here before the five days last week. That's the best. Right? Go out on our pond. Oh. It's been a great Friday. It's been a long time. And the guy in the city is glowing. And I have left the stick in hot. I have left like, my windows open and still lit off. Hi, Bobby. How are you? 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 Hello everyone. I'm Lakers Junior High. I'm uh, principal here, Kurt Schultz, and I am so excited to welcome you all to Device, uh, which is a continuation of our parent education uh, evenings around digital parenting, which is a thing that we all have to deal with now, um, and it gives us some great opportunities to have conversations with kids. We had three assemblies earlier in the day today, and I don't know if you talked to your children about those, um, but kids responded really positively to uh, the information that they received, and you may have friends who aren't here this evening who want to see this or know about this or if you've had conversations with them about hey, how are you managing your kids' tech, or what are you doing about this or that? Um, and we are actually live streaming this via the school's YouTube channel. Um, and it is, I tweeted out the link to that just a moment ago. So if you follow us on Twitter and you want to reshare that, you can copy that link. Or if you're a Facebooker, you can copy that link on Facebook. Or if you just like YouTube, you can find it on YouTube there. Uh, or if at some point this evening you find yourself fading because it's been a long day and oh I missed that three minutes um, you can go back to our YouTube channel after tonight and watch this later or watch it with your kids or watch it with your friends or show your grandma whatever you want to do uh, and you can actually control the speed of it too so you could jump ahead and then watch three minutes worth of presentation in a minute and a half or slow it down it's really exciting technology is amazing and it has challenges and so that's uh, a great reason for us to all be together and learning together tonight about how to support our kids really, really well. Uh, and we were fortunate to have an expert in the room with us to guide us through that conversation and through that thinking. Uh, I don't know her as well as others do, and so I am actually going to hand off to our amazing facilitator of library awesomeness every day, <laughs> Kari Reed, uh, who's going to introduce our speaker for the evening. Let's give Kari a round of applause. Thank you. serving many of your students if they're not here already. I'm the library tech assistant this year. This is my first year. I've been here since August. So some of you have maybe income of sixth graders and we're very excited to have them too. It's been a whole year of learning for me. Uh, there's been an amazing um, transition that's been here, but but there's a little there's a little bird over here I just want you to know and, and the, behind the big screen it says we are a library. This is a library and it says not to perish as digital ways but fixed in time. And I think it's totally appropriate to say that in the air, in in the age of technology, how do we fix things? How do we hold? How do we um, make them significant and keep them around? Which is always what we're trying to teach students to do: is live in their present moment. 
um, and learn from the mistakes they've made in the past. Those of you who are here on the behalf of the Blitz, I see you, you're here, there is a game going on, and currently the score is Portland 23, Warriors 27. And I'm not at all offended if you swipe down on the ESPN app. Okay, and either will Dory. Do you remember back in the day when this was a charger? And we didn't know. And we didn't know what other charger there was. And now things have changed. Uh, as of October. So now, now when they come and say, I need a charger, Miss Reed, and I say, which one? We have five Chromebooks here. Um, so we are in a transition. Doreen is amazing. She has a doctorate of psych psychology from Rosemead. She is a surrogate aunt to me, and uh, she and my aunt went to school together, so I'm already connected with her as hopefully her next of kin. You will not be disappointed. She has an unbelievable presentation and the ability to leave you with her insights um, and her research. So without further ado, thank you, Doreen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So a uh, little, a few words about tonight. Hopefully the pipe cleaners have made their way around to you all or are making their way around. These are for you to play with because it is late in the evening and you're all tired. The other thing I want to encourage you to do is if you need to stand up or come, maybe you will need to lie down, you can rest right here or, or do some yoga, but do whatever you need to do to stay active and alert and to be present because it's hard. I would encourage you to keep your phone out, actually, and you are welcome to take pictures. All the slides are very simple, so that you can take pictures of them if you want. I would love for us to just basically get to have an experience together, so I don't want you to have to think about taking notes or keeping track you can, watch this again on Facebook, but also on my website, on the speaking tab, there's a, a link at the bottom that has handouts, every kind of handout from every version of this talk that has ever existed, uh, you can find there. And I, I, I want you to know that so that you can just kind of let the information wash over you tonight. And mostly that is because I am going to be talking very, very fast. And sadly, because of our time constraints, we're not going to have a lot of interaction. At the end, I'll try to save a few minutes for question and answer, and I'll stick around. But I normally anymore don't agree to speak to an audience unless I can be, unless I can be present for about two or three hours. Now, right now, you're thinking, oh, good Lord, save my soul. Like, <laughs> that sounds horrible, right? But I, I predict that at the end, you're going to think, oh, I see how that makes sense. Because this topic is so huge. And if I weight it on one side, the side of how this is impacting us, or the other side, what we can do about it, people end up either leaving feeling anxious, like, oh my gosh, we're going, you know, what is happening? Or, like, they don't really understand why it's important to do some of the things. So I've, I've tried to pare this down to make it a doable thing in two hours. Um, but I know that, that uh, there's a lot we're going to be skipping over. So we're getting a very kind of top of the surface uh, look at things. The next thing I want to say is that I have great empathy. I do not in any way pretend to have things figured out. This is a photo that happened in my house about four years ago when I walked into the family room and everybody had their own computer and, you know, also next to them you can't see, but they all also have their phones out. I get this. I have a 24-year-old. I have a 26-year-old. My husband works in high tech. Um, I understand how, how difficult it is to try to figure out how to have a home where our embodied experiences are exciting. Um, I also did not say those pipe cleaners, did I say that, are the playlist, so make crazy things and you'll also help me out when you're wearing like pipe cleaner glasses and antenna. Um, in any case, so I really understand, I get this, and I don't in any way want to send a message that I think technology is bad. I think technology is incredible. It allows us to do things we never could have done without it. Um, I just am finishing, coming off of 15 years of doing research circles uh, that resulted in this book with about 30,000 uh, university students, parents, psychiatrists, and educators. So my information that I'm bringing you tonight is not only from peer-reviewed research, but from a lot of late night uh, coffee sessions in dorms or in the coffee shop at universities, talking to young adults who grew up with technology as you know, a sibling, as a friend, as a part of their kind of being. And I'm bringing you a lot of kind of anecdotal research that is always kind of cross-referenced with the peer-reviewed research. So I want you to know these aren't just opinions. There is, there is kind of heft and bulk to this work. Before we go anywhere, I want to introduce the concept of non-shaming conversations and empathy. If you take what I share with you tonight and go home and use it to slam information down your child's throat, it will fail immensely. 
But instead, if we can all take time tonight to just think about how, how we can use this information in non-shaming ways. If you're here with your partner, what oftentimes happens in situations like this is I will watch at one point in the talk, one of the partners elbows the other one like, yeah, you need to hear that. And then a couple minutes later, it's the opposite way. So rather than thinking about how can I use this information to kind of, you know, catch people, let's think about just non-shaming ways of using it. Okay, everybody take a deep breath. You all seem very serious in your um, all right, so if you, everybody knows what this what these letters are for, right? Yeah? No, I know, I know. No, no, no. <laughs> in real life, right? So if you look at the literature, I'm uh, sorry, I'm pulling on my dress, this might be my case, I feel like I'm like choking. Um, in real life, in the literature, stands for what we would typically call our embodied experience. The issue that I have with this language in the literature is, first of all, research that is coming out right now, the peer review research right now, is coming out all about how Facebook is impacting high schoolers. Well, let me tell you, high schoolers are not on Facebook, right? And so the peer reviewed research cycle takes so long to get out there that really we are lagging behind. And we now are talking about and living in a reality where screens go with us everywhere. A preponderance of our social gatherings are spent with us looking down, right? In our kids' classroom, they are using more and more technology. We're having less and less, you know, embodied learning without a technology form present. And we laugh or we think, like, oh, ho, ho. But we also know that a majority of tweets coming from adult men come from when they're sitting on the toilet. <laughs> this is a pretty well done research, actually. And it's kind of funny, right? But the modeling that takes place when our screens now go everywhere and where there's no place off limits where they don't go really does make a, make a uh, difference to children. Two years ago at the Consumer Electronics Showcase, which that's where all the new technologies are always kind of brought out, this won the toy of the year, and it's called the iPod. Now, what's a problem about that to me is that, you know, teaching children to use the toilet is a really important time for teaching them to tap into their bodies, right? To know what's going on and to, and to kind of learn to trust the impulses of their bodies. If we start introducing technology even to that, we really are kind of confusing children, and this is happening more and more. This is Fisher Price's activity line, and it's a whole line of teething toys and young uh, infant toys where you put either a tablet or a smartphone in. And we know there's some new research out that shows that if you give 80% of six-month-old children a small rectangular object, the first thing they do is swipe their hand across it, right? So this is now a normalizing part of our children's experience. And not only is just the an engagement with technology a normalizing part, but over and over and over, they are sent this very subtle but clear message. <laughs> lives that are interesting and complex where we take appropriate risks where we create kind of the ability to live through awkward moments not just pointing them out right but more and more of our technology is trying to kind of replicate what we would think of as real life places like snapchat where experiences happen but then they kind of morph away so it feels more like embodied experience in technical in technological spaces so we need to start thinking about is that really what we want to encourage as a real life? As we enter the world of virtual reality, which is becoming more and more um, 
available in households, this is going to become an even greater issue. So in educational systems and in households, when in, in let's say at school, when you can do your ancient Greece report by putting on a pair of VR goggles and you can see ancient Greece and you can hear the sounds and it's, everything is crystal clear and looks like it's actually happening, why in the world would you make a sugar cube pyramid anymore, right? And there are these subtle trade-offs that we make. And over time, if we add in all of these amazing advancements without being mindful of using them moderately, we end up subtly sending children a message that what they can take in or consume in technology is better than what they can create with their own being. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. I love the interaction. We can do all kinds of call and response. You guys can snap and amen and whatever you want. Um, but what we want to be careful about is not just as subtly and slowly reinforcing this idea that shiny online digital experiences are better than our actual embodied experiences. Kids are going to actually naturally kind of have a propensity to think that. So we have to help them realize that even though all these spaces seem incredibly you know, more exciting and wonderful, the technology is neither all good nor all bad, <laughs> that it has some amazing potential, but that we do need to be aware of some of the difficulties with it. It is not benign. Technology and digital spaces are not benign. They have a purpose behind them. Some of them are great, some of them not so much. But we also need to think about taking away the language of taming the natives. You know, a lot of people will say we've got digital natives and digital non-natives, and then the non-natives feel like they go in and tame the natives. That would not be appropriate language anywhere, right? And it does not need to be the kind of way we think about this here. Instead, we need to think about how can we all learn how to use this form of communication, of connection, of education, of entertainment in a way that makes us more healthy, in a way that actually lets us be more of who we are as humans rather than less. In keeping with that, if you look at a lit review, these are all the traits that uh, come out in lit reviews right now about what technology enhances. So this is a great list, and if we had up to six hours, which is my preference with people, <laughs> we would talk more about these. The thing to be aware of with this list that's important to know is that you have to look at it and decide if you think these are positive traits or not. For instance, if you look at, um, let's say, multitasking. So this is basically saying if you use high levels of technology, you become a very good multitasker. Well, there is no research, I checked in today, no research that shows that multitasking makes us better at an at activity or makes our outcome more um, kind of, you know, uh, I don't know, more wonderful, <laughs> right? Multitasking typically and in the research is shown to actually diminish the way in which we do a task. So we have to decide, do we really think that is a positive or is it really like saying, I smoke a lot, so I'm a really good smoker, <laughs> right? You know, like, I use technology a lot, so I'm a really good multitasker. Um, the other thing to know about this list is that when you when you look at the literature, there is not yet a study that shows that things like creativity, which improve if you're using kinds of digital technology that encourage creativity, we see an increase in digital creativity. We don't know yet if that transfers outside of the digital domain. So these things end up being positive traits, but we don't know if they kind of exist away from digital domains. We do know these last uh, three are transferable outside of technology use. So surgeons and pilots, <laughs> Have a you know have increased visual spatial awareness and enhanced visual motor skills from using technology that appears to be a helpful thing. If you take that same lit review and pull out the negative things or the things that we might like to see less of in our children, this is the list we come up with. And if you take this list and boil it down to its most essential elements across the research in the last ten years, this is what we are seeing. These are highly correlated depression, anxiety, competition, comparison, and relational aggression. These are consistently and highly correlated with high technology use. Now, until about three or four months ago, we, we could say that's all we know, is that high levels of technology use are correlated with these psychological constructs. In the last three months, we have two very well-constructed peer review studies that for the first time show causation, meaning Time and specifically in these two studies, time spent in social media spaces, that means video gaming where you're interacting with people online or Instagram or Facebook or any of those kind of platforms, that the use of those in untethered ways, so unlimited use of them, actually can cause 
anxiety, depression, and agitation, which is up here. And that's really important to think about because, again, remember our research lags behind. So if we're learning that now based on use two or three years ago, it's probably even more intense than we know. So the thing as we talk more specifically about these impacts that I want you to think about are just really the only big takeaway from tonight is that I want to encourage you all to moderate your tech use and to model that well to your kids. This morning I started out, um, or I guess this afternoon, in each one of the three assemblies literally getting on my knees and asking for their forgiveness from my generation because my generation has handed this technology and then talked absolute smack about them, right? We just talk horribly to their title screen dependent you know <laughs> and it's and they hear that and all the while they hear that they watch us texting and candy crushing ourselves you know into oblivion and so we need to be aware of our own use and how we model the reason that that's important is that we now know the research is very clear and very um it continues to to come forth clear about the fact that americans over the age of 13 now spend 12 and a half hours a day with screens now the troubling thing about the statistic is that this, act, this statistic, which came from the Annenberg uh, Center for Digital Communication, the Tau Center for Journalism, and um, Kaiser Family Foundation, they're all incredibly great research think tanks. Um, this statistic is a couple of years old and was based on recreational use and entertainment use alone, not educational or vocational. So think about that. That's concerning. Now, the way that we get to 12 and a half hours, or the way that the researchers did, is most Americans now multi-use with technology. So you're on your phone texting while you're watching a movie, or you're working on a project on your laptop and you're, you're listening to a podcast on your phone, right? If you do that, if you do that activity, so you're using two devices for one hour, you put those hours side by side and that equals two hours because the load on the brain and the body is so intense that it appears to have a cumulative effect if you look at the science of it. Now for a normal uh, middle school student right now, if they consider, I mean, if they continue to consume technology at that rate, this is my then 20 year old son hugging my then 60 year old uncle, they will have dedicated 20 full years of their life to practicing engagement with their device. 20 full years. What was really interesting is today when I would say that statistic to watch the peppered faces in the crowd of middle schoolers kind of, you know, like, that's a lot of practice. You know, if you spent 20 years practicing layups, you'd be really good at layups. So do we really want to have 20 years of our lives dedicated in this way? And as parents, we need to think about that because that 12 and a half hours, it's not as though we got technology and then we got, oh, look, you, you 12 and a half hours to your day, right? That did not occur. You guys are all very serious. <laughs> so anytime you want to laugh, it's super helpful. Um, <laughs> um, the reason that this is so important is because the four places that that 12 and a half hours come from are really important things. They are important developmental tasks that allow children to grow into really satisfied, healthy, engaged, interesting adults. They come from family talk time. Family talk time is just when you're sitting around the table and you learn that one thing that you say that pushes mom or dad right over the edge, you know, and you learn, maybe I don't say that next time. Or it's where you learn how to have conflict or where you learn how to compliment each other. Maybe it's where you just learn how to be bored out of your absolute mind. You know, you can hear everyone just chewing. Whatever it is, there are important skills that happen when we are, as a family, without devices talking. There are also crucially important skills that are learned in social practice. Social practice is literally this, me standing up here and talking in front of you and finding out that, you know, even if I just sweat myself into oblivion and end up dripping, you know, that you're all going to somehow stay here and I'm going to live through it, right? <laughs> Rather than like, you know, just hiding into my phone or whatever it might be. Social practice is huge. Social practice is actually on the decline for younger and younger people. And let me tell you the subtle ways this is happening. Even the small thing, which seems so cool and so great and so convenient, that you order your coffee ahead of time or order your meal ahead of time and pay for it and pick it up at another counter, that is robbing children of social practice. Because just to go up, and if you ask a lot of middle school to high schooler kids, or children now, you ask them to go up and order eye to eye, it is anxiety provoking to them. Anybody relate to this? Your kids relate to this? Yeah. There are literally just fewer and fewer opportunities for them. There are therapists, there's a whole therapy practice in Portland. It's always fun when I get to speak at home because I know a little bit more about home than when I'm in wherever else I am. Um, but there's a whole therapy practice in Portland now, and they have a waiting list that is four months old, or four months long, I'm sorry. And all they do is take 
young adolescents into out into the world and have them have social experiences. One of the ones that is hardest for the, the students is they have to bring $5 worth of coins in a small pouch or something with them. They have to go into a coffee shop, order their drink, eye to eye, pay for it or to, you know get their little coins out to pay for it. Actually, they have to accidentally drop their coins gather them up and pay for them because this is such an anxiety provoking experience. But after doing it two or three times, you find out you can live in the world, you can make mistakes, you can look like a dork and get through it, right? But think about the ways that we are kind of escaping those opportunities now. Sleep and physical activity, you guys all know how that is, you know, being impacted by tech use. The reason that these two are so important is that sleep is the way we regenerate, and physical activity is often the way that the mind regenerates. You know, when we get our bodies active, it lets our mind go a little bit to rebuild. So the fact that these two things are on the decline is a real concern for the development of our children. If we think about human development, kind of like the development of a tree, you know, you're going to plant a certain kind of seed, and that kind of tree is going to grow out of the ground. It's not like you're going to plant a pomegranate tree and get an apple tree, right? You're going to plant a, a pomegranate tree seed, and you're going to get a pomegranate tree. However, the conditions of the soil, the water, the nutrients of the soil, the light, the air, all impact the development of this tree. And our children are like this. They, they, they come from more seed, which is the weirdest thing to say. But they're going to grow up into people, right? But the contextual elements around them are going to shape them. This is a tree on the Oregon coast. You know, when the coastal winds blow over that tree, it's not like all, it was straight one day and then all of a sudden it went, no, subtly over time, the tree begins to bend until it is really kind of not in the shape that it would probably have been if it had different conditions around it. Technology is like this. It is profoundly shaping an entire people group, which is the people group of us. <laughs> and we need to be aware of that so that we can make choices about the contextual elements <laughs> that we surround ourselves with and that we kind of place our children within. Again, just one big breath together that we are going to have non-shaming conversations because <laughs> I'm about to get into the meat of what the research is telling us. And I'm going to watch your anxiety go up, 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 up. I, I, I have a practice in Lake Oswego, actually, in my office with a psychiatrist. And I, when I was leaving there this, to come here this evening, I told him, like, maybe you'd like to come at the door and, like, hand out anti-anxiety medications <laughs> <laughs> um, as a joke. So we're, these are non-shaming conversations. I work with these folks all the time. I spend a huge bulk of time reading the research and reading pop culture reviews and with young adults. And I have immense hope. I have immense empathy because I think it is harder to grow up now than it has ever been. It is harder to be a child, an adolescent, a young adult than it's ever been. I also have immense empathy for you all because I think it is harder to be a parent than it has ever been. These are the four areas of impact of our technology use. Basically, it's affecting our bodies. It's affecting our relational selves. It's affecting the very development of a sense of self. And that's something that I'm particularly interested in and that the literature only now, 20 years into this, is starting to talk about. And then it's also affecting our sense of embodiment. And our sense of embodiment just means the way that we do or don't live in our skin. So let, what is that? We're going to start with this one first. Basically, this means that we are now relying on data often more than on embodied experience. So again, at the Consumer Electronics Showcase <clears throat> um, to, last year, wearable monitors were all the rage. So this is a wearable baby monitor. And I, most of you probably have children in this room, right? When was there a time in your life when you were more anxious than when you brought a newborn baby home? Pretty anxiety provoking time, right? <laughs> now, you put a monitor on your baby, and these monitors, there's one version that lives in the onesie, and it literally sends heart rate, respiration, room temperature, and body temperature to your phone at 20 minute intervals. That is really anxiety provoking, right? This one, you can even talk to your baby with, so if baby's crying, like dad's voice suddenly comes out of his foot. This <laughs> is very, very confusing. And what this subtly sends a message to the parent and to the world is that the data about your child can tell you more about your child than actually just, you know, tripping through those early years and learning how and what your child needs. All these sleep monitors now that, you know, I've got parents who are watching their baby sleep and if their baby moves at all, they're in there instantly. 
child then doesn't get to learn how to kind of wiggle around and work their way back to sleep. And just so that we don't feel too proud, we do the same exact thing with fitness trackers. So there's a whole new wealth of information right now, or I'm sorry, research out there right now showing how Fitbits are creating sleep disorders for perfectionists in America. And this is because we rely, rather than waking up and seeing how do I feel, do I feel rested? No, we wake up and we go, oh my goodness, I only slept three hours. Your Fitbit has no idea when you're sleeping, by the way. It just knows when you're still and makes some inferences about it. But we rely on that in such a way that we kind of are creating this separateness and we're modeling this for our kids. To make it worse, our kids are just being marketed to nonstop by products something like this. Hello, Dream House. Open the door. Hello, Dream House. Let's bake some cookies. Notice how little kids Let's bake some cookies. Okay, the oven is on. You can go back to what you were doing. I'll let you know when the cookies are ready. Hello, Dream House. It's cold. Okay, here's another example. This is my digital makeover. I insert my own iPad, open the app, and the mirror lights up. I do my eyeshadow, lipstick, blush, and start again. So many colors, glitter, accessories, even masks. How amazing is that? Barbie Digital Makeover. Batteries and iPad not included. You know, yeah. so it's easier than having to clean up your kid's face with a ton of makeup on it or whatever, you know. But also we're sending subtle messages that it's okay to be really extreme and to do it in this way that then we can send to everyone, right? These hypersexualized images. Here's the new Hot Wheel. You no longer crawl around on the floor. You don't put the Hot Wheel on the iPad and the trap moves under you. That's a winner, right? And the more we do this, the more we send these messages, the more normal it seems. And the thing that concerns me most is that it kind of sends this, or it, it inoculates kids. It's not as fun to just roll around on the floor if you've had a changing track under you with a you know, high-level stand-on track that makes you sound like you're a race car driver, right? We're just not going to sit on the floor and be like, I can't even make the car sound, but I can try. Um, we just, again, are sending the message that this having things done for us is somehow better than our own creative invention. And creative invention is a way that kids learn. It's a way that they develop into kind of hardy, robust people. We also have to be aware of the fact that universities now, most universities, I think the new statistic is something like 75 percent, have esports teams. These are video game teams. They have full ride scholarships that come out of the physical education departments, and these are literally for gaming. So I have a number of people in my uh, practice right now who, you know, their kids told them, well, I have one person who gave up a full ride scholarship, academic scholarship, to become a professional gamer outside of the academy. But, but parents will say, well, they can't do that. They can do that. <laughs> there are people doing that. And so we need to be aware that this is a reality that our children are seeing. And unless we are informed and educated and aware of it and can have, again, non-shaming, non-alarming, non-freaking out conversations, <laughs> if we can't do that, then our kids create this kind of underground fascination with this stuff and determination. Just like anything else, like if I put a cake in front of you and say, don't eat it, don't eat it, don't eat it, don't eat it. They have this stuff in front of them all the time. And we need to be aware. We need to be aware because even though this is happening at universities, we also have research that shows that for gamers in particular, they have a really hard time adjusting to college life and a really hard time performing academically because the games are becoming so much more effective at being addictive. So the World Health Organization has now uh, stated or has now created a diagnostic category for video gaming because this is becoming such an issue and so many people are losing so much of their lives mm -hmm. to gaming. Um, we, again, we need to start thinking about that and taking seriously how to help our kids change their habits and norms, which we're going to get into in the second half of tonight. The other thing that we're at risk of in terms of just embodiment is that if our lives, if we aren't offering kind of exciting, risky, embodied experiences, our kids will happily find them in online spaces. You can find any manner of risky, wild, sparkly experience, right? And if we aren't offering that in our body lives, why wouldn't they kind of, you know, find themselves attracted to these spaces where they have 100% control where they can control what is going to happen and the outcomes and the feedback they get, and where it is beautiful. 
And this is something I find a lot. Um, I find that people don't necessarily want to play, you know, super highly violent video games, like this is Grand Theft Auto V, but Grand Theft Auto V and other violent or sexualized games are the, the games that have the most resources, the most money, and they make themselves the most beautiful, the most beautiful soundtracks, the most beautiful visuals. And then we find ourselves there because we want high strategy, and then pretty soon we're sinking more and more time into these high strategy places that, that you know, kind of get our brain going in interesting ways. But sadly, we are doing it alongside of content that really can harm us. So it's a little bit like, you know, there's there's no room to put any cyanide in your potato salad. Like, it will just kill you, right? <laughs> and so to say that we're learning pro-social skills from highly violent sexualized content, it's a little bit like saying I eat potato salad with cyanide. It, it, there are some negative things we need to think about. Um, we also just have to think about in terms of embodiment that children are being confronted with altered images of bodies all the time. It's now considered a pretty reliable statistic that 97% of images that we see on screen have in some way been doctored in some way. And so for young boys, now we're seeing a preponderance. I did, I did, um, it was keynote at the Providence Pediatric, Pediatric Conference last year, and they had me come specifically because they're seeing now, uh, eating disorders and body dysmorphia disorders for young boys as young as fifth grade, because they're seeing these hyper-masculinized images and video games, and they can't quite figure out how to attain that. We've always known uh, for young girls that you know there's a lot of comparison and competition, but we're now seeing this equally for both genders. And what I like to show kids is things like this, where Target accidentally went in, and you can see they went in, the designer went in and cut out her inner thighs on the bathing suit, but then forgot to go back in and fill in the bathing suit. So you can see that this was actually an altered image. Do you guys see that? Things like this can be really, really helpful because our kids, what they are doing instead of learning to be kind of good or, or, or actual um, real uh, discerning connoisseurs of media, instead they're just taking these images in and saying, well, if everybody else is doctoring their images, how can I? So things like self-improvement apps have become very common. These you download on your phone and they will apply to all of your photos of yourself so you can thin yourself out, you can make your skin darker or lighter. Um, and, and instead of that, wouldn't it be fantastic if we were raising kids to know how to kind of accept who they are and to live within their reality? The one thing that I do want to talk about before we go off of this topic, usually, again, usually we would have a very long time, and I'm just trying to make this all concise, is that, that it, along with the medical world and educational world, the place where most money is being sunk into VR is in porn. And we already are seeing as psychologists, psychiatrists, and pediatricians the incidence of sexual disorders is now trending down to about 15 to 18 years old, especially for boys. And that is because the way in which porn is being consumed now is that in a, an average uh, porn visit to porn sites is in this, I looked in this actually in a three mile radius right here. Um, it's usually twice a day for 11 minutes. And in that 11 minutes, 12 websites or 12 different sites are accessed. And that means that every minute we're changing a site, right? And so our brain is wiring to sexual activity or to sexual stimulation in such a way that our embodied bodies can never offer. And so does this make sense to you guys? And kids are terrified to talk to their parents about this stuff because they know most of us parents will react something like this, right? <laughs> or worse. And so, um, so we need, again, to be able to start these non-shaming conversations. The thing that is tricky about VR porn is that when you put those goggles on and you look down, everything is actually happening to your body. And the developing brain of an individual up through age about 21 cannot discern what is actually happening to a physical body versus a body that feels so much like theirs in VR. So, so the incidence of real confusion with VR porn and VR um, weighted guns is very real. It is very real. And we need to really be mindful of this before we adopt these technologies <laughs> widestream. Okay, take a deep breath because I know that's really exciting. But I still have a ton of hope and I think the world is a beautiful place. <laughs> um, I would encourage all of you to go on Common Sense Media tonight and read as much as they've got there about VR porn. They're the group that is really staying on top of it well, I think. It, helping parents know how to have those conversations. They are also the best right now at giving parents tips of how to talk about 
body dysmorphia, body image issues, and things like that. Okay, now I'm gonna, in each of these sections, each of the four areas where technology is impacting us, I'm gonna have a slide with interventions. You're welcome to take a picture. They're also on those handouts on my website. These are just things that are practical, you know, a few easy things you can do at home. One of the easiest things you can do at home is to make your home welcoming of the body. These are literally, I just took all the things off of my coffee tables and the bins under my coffee table today. And in fact, if you guys want to come and get these things and play with them, you I'm not kidding, come and get them, feel free. Have bowls of kinetic sand around. We're going to talk about this later, but if you have things out and about your house that people want to pick up and play with, you will suddenly find that they have left their phones. You know, they, they don't remember where their phones are. Also, establishing screen-free zones in homes is really hugely important. Get out your old alarm clocks and have everybody dock their phone in the kitchen at night, right? Um, try to have some places where these things just don't go with us. Put a little basket outside the bathroom door. Stick the phone there when you go in the bathroom. Um, and then finally, attending to all the senses, especially for children. So the other thing that I like to speak on and that I speak a lot on is multiple intelligences. And, if, and for kiddos who are kinesthetically wired, they are going to die if all they have is technology. They need touch. They need smells. They need tastes. They need sounds. All of us do. So if we can make our homes enticing to the body, there's a much better chance that our children will stay healthy within their bodies. Okay, speaking of that, we have to talk about how technology is shaping the body. Um, if you guys remember, if you need to move around, stay away, get up, do some cartwheels. Um, while I was writing the book, the book was a very uh, labor-intensive process, so I, I, there was one area of research that I just literally couldn't stay up on. It was kind of coming to the front, the forefront of things, right as I was in the process with my publisher of publishing, and I just couldn't include it. But I feel I would be remiss in not bringing it up. We now know with pretty great reliability that exposure to the levels of frequency that we experience with our smartphones um, is creating tumors in rats at much higher rates than we would have liked. It's really interesting that my last two talks were one was on the East Coast and one was in the Midwest. People came up at the break and they were both two, how many two men? They both had tumors removed from their thigh right here where their phone sits in their pocket. Um, these are, they are, at first we thought these were benign tumors, but it's now the American Academy of Pediatrics has now come out and said actually they are cancerous tumors that, it, that are associated. So I just, this is something that I feel like all of us need to be aware of and start thinking about. So I, I just want to make us all aware. A couple other things, um, retinal damage, we are now seeing the American Academy of, of Ophthalmologists just came out with a, well, not just anymore, two years ago, came out with a white paper that showed that the incidence of macular degeneration and um, oh, cataracts are now trending down into the 40s. So we're seeing the incidence of these at younger ages, and that's because we're having blue light exposure to the retina, and especially the developing retina of a child, if they're holding it close, it creates a propensity for those illnesses later on. We also are seeing thumb arthritis on the rise, woohoo, right? So we want to be aware of that. So just some interventions for those physiological things, turning away from screens an hour before bed so that you aren't releasing neurotransmitters of the brain with the use of blue light. Using ambience instead of overhead light, that just means light that is at eye level. Placing your screens, um, you know, next to windows instead of in front of them. And then applying filters. I, I, I have a colleague who is a, an expert in eye health, and she says, you know, using the blue light filters is great and everything, but it's a little bit like putting a filter on a cigarette. It, it, it doesn't protect you, so just be aware of that. Um, okay, now we're going to talk about the brain, which is super interesting. And I'm going to try to do it really quickly. All right, so the brain has basically four quadrants. It has a left quadrant and a right quadrant. The left quadrant is very linear, linguistic, logical. It loves that I just used a lot of L's. If there are any engineers in the room, you know, you really understand this part of the brain. It is very just so, right? The right side of the brain is very kind of creative and expansive and much more uh, kind of chaotic. <laughs> you know, if you ask the left side of the brain to stand up, it would stand and sit down, it would, you know, be like this. Yes, the right side of the brain is down and sit down, it would be like, woohoo! I gotta stand up and sit back down, right? You know, like that. We've got these two halves. Then we have the upstairs and the downstairs part of the brain. The upstairs part of the brain, like a beach house, the upstairs has all the big windows where you can see far, where you can, you know, take in beauty, where you can have deep conversations. This is the critical thinking, the expansive part of the brain that can really do a lot of deep work. The downstairs part of a beach house has the kitchen, the bathroom, the mudroom, right? The downstairs part of the brain is literally the reptilian brain. It's the, the burping, farting part of the brain that literally just keeps you moving along. A healthy brain, when I was in graduate school, um, 
roughly one million years ago. <laughs> now most of the things I learned are we now know are not right anymore. Um, we really thought of the brain as a pile cabinet. So if you needed math information and you know you got some stimulation in your brain, you went and looked at the math pile in your brain. Now we know actually that a healthy brain looks much more like a tangled jungle or a very quick rushing stream. And a quick rushing stream or these tangles within a jungle can adapt when something comes into them. So when when you know a stream hits a boulder, it goes around the boulder, but then it kind of comes back and it'll veer to the right again and veer up and veer down, right? So when information comes into the brain, it comes in through one of our senses, it sends an electrical impulse through the brain, hopefully to the back upper part of the brain, where we get great retention and recall, where we get an ability to be just so, but also where there's some, some right side stimulation, so we can be somewhat flexible, right? Well, what happens with technology, it looks like, is that it looks like it throws such a huge log into the stream of the brain that it actually really short circuits wiring in certain parts of the brain. Can anybody imagine where it redirects? If this is our brain model, where does it redirect? This log comes in and it pushes the wiring of the brain into what region when we're playing video games? And anybody have a guess? Downstairs. Yeah, the left downstairs part of the brain. So the analytic burping, farting brain is getting all kinds of stimulation, right? <laughs> and we are avoiding, we're actually pruning off other important regions. And the brain works on the principle of where the brain fires together, it wires together. What this means is that if you are not actually intentionally forcing the brain to be exposed to boredom, to be exposed to deep critical thought, literally you will prune off the brain's ability to do that. So when a kiddo just can't sit still, it's not that they just don't want to, it's literally that we have no longer wired the brain for the ability to sit still. This is made worse by the fact that the endocrine system, which releases hormones, and the brain, the neurological system, are meant to work together. And when the brain and the neurological system, I mean the neurological and hormonal system work together, it's when we feel like we're in the zone, when you're just doing things and it feels right. You guys know what that feels like? In the zone, right? Most of the time, when those two, two systems are not working together, like all of adolescence, right? <laughs> we feel dysregulated. And what is happening now is that technology is actually creating a reality where we feel dysregulated. And that helps the tech com companies because when we're dysregulated, we want to keep watching so that we can get to a sense of regulation. So it keeps us in the technology. Let me just show you how this happens. Um, I'm going to show you an advertisement. Listen to the words of the music and the sound of the music and then see if it goes with or does not go with the visuals. <laughs> <laughs> it's very disruptive and if you notice it's timed exactly well like so it says caring and it's a bomb going off literally now lest we feel prideful this is how we get suckered into this kind of programming footage of happy people doing happy things to distract you from horrifying drug side effects Serious side effects may happen, including pancreatitis. Common side effects are nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, decreased appetite, chest pain, shortness of breath, diarrhea, severe stomach pain, or tenderness. Tiredness, loss of appetite, stomach pain, and eating or bruising more easily than normal. Aggression, hostility, agitation, depressed mood, sickness, cough, vomiting, weakness, or ankle swelling. Other side effects include gas, stomach area pain, sleepwalking, or allergic and skin reactions, which could be life threatening. May cause your skin to temporarily turn yellow or orange. Blood clots and the extreme fatigue, constipation, excessive thirst of urine, swollen ankles, loss of appetite, rash, itching, headache, confusion, hallucinations, infections, tiredness, nausea, sore mouth, abnormalities, and liver blood tests, diarrhea, hair thinning or loss, vomiting, rash, and loss of appetite. Alice calls it her new normal. <laughs> <laughs> now, if we were to go back in our six hour version, we'd go back and you'd see that when it says things like orange skin, it's a beautiful woman looking in a mirror, you know. But we all are prone to being manipulated by this. And the reason that this is important is it isn't just that it manipulates our behavior, it actually is wiring the brain. So again, remembering that what I said, when the brain wires together, it fires together. 
What we expose the brain to in terms of stimulation is what creates the capacity of the brain. So if we are only, only presenting it with information that is constantly changing, we are actually wiring the brain to only be able to handle constantly changing stimulation. So here's how that happens. We're going to watch three different decades of um, Sesame Street clips, and I want you to count the number of seconds in each, each kind of visual um, shot. So this would be like one, Tanker carrying 38 million gallons of oil continues to burn. And then watch this one. When there's nothing moving on the screen, even the logo moves. And Happy New Year. Hundreds of thousands of party goers celebrate the night away in Times Square. Okay, so do you guys see how this happens? Does it make sense? Like, so the brain used to have to wait 8 to 10 seconds for something new. So literally the brain is forced to have wiring in what's called the prefrontal cortex, um, which is where we have all of our executive <laughs> functioning. Our prefrontal cortex is what makes us be able to wait, what makes us be able to start to do something and realize, oh, we need to not do that and slow down. It's what makes us be able to communicate effectively, to have eye contact, to tolerate emotional kind of distress. It also is what helps us actually change our course of action. So if we're doing something and we need to change course. We don't fire, this part of the brain is not stimulated unless there is at least 8 to 10 seconds of stimulation, 8 to 10 seconds of having to focus. So you can see in this newer forms of technology, we are wiring the brain to actually miss that whole experience. So like Laura Ingalls just a lot of the day had to be bored out of her brain, right? Like, oh, a stick, it's a doll! You know, like, I mean, you just had to. There was no option. Now, unless we create those opportunities, we literally are not forcing the brain to have stimulation and wiring that region. Does this make sense to you guys? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Why does Sesame Street do that? Well, this is a whole other topic that I would love to talk about more. Yes, it's, it's just, yes, even, yeah, okay. I'm going to bring myself back here. Thank you. <laughs> we also are, are kind of just being that short. I bring this up with my younger children's parents because um, they are not taught how to think critically and deeply, and this is really coming out. If you talk to college professors, they'll say people have very long um, bibliographies, but they don't know how to think deeply. Just uh, two years ago, Google introduced what they call the right answer that is in a box, but 80% of the time, the right answer, which is comes in a box at the top of your search, is not right. <laughs> So this is when you type in why is the red truck red, or why is the wire fire truck red, it just gives you the lyrics to a song. It's, it's not even anything true. But this happens at 80% regularity. So we need to be teaching our kids how to kind of stop multitasking, stop all the searches, and instead be able to push the wiring into that part of the brain. There's a new study out of the University of London. Actually, it's not new anymore. It's about a year old. Um, and I asked the researcher if I could use his research, and he said, I, yes, but if I would please read this to uh, my audiences. So he says, our study at the University of London found that participants, which his participants happened to be white men between the ages of 28 and 52, um, found that participants who multitasked during cognitive tasks experienced IQ score declines that were similar to what they'd expect if they had smoked marijuana for six hours or stayed up all night. <laughs> IQ drops of 15 points for multitasking white men lowered their scores to the average range of an eight-year-old child. So the next time your audience is writing their boss an email during your lecture, remind them that their cognitive capacity is being diminished to the point that they might as well let an eight-year-old write it for them. <laughs> so again, when we multitask, we really do diminish the brain. So some interventions in terms of just your brain content, 
limiting screen time early on. Most of you have children of the age or you yourselves have habituated to high levels of media use already. So we're going to talk about how to counteract that. Teach self-soothing skills. Get very serious about teaching self-soothing skills. And we're going to talk about how to do that. Forcing delay of gratification some of the time. Literally, it is now a radical act of neurological health to watch only one episode of your favorite show a week, rather than the entire season at one setting. Um, so literally, create opportunities for boredom. We have boredom parties at our house, um, and they are actually fun. Um, and then really thinking about especially violent sexualized media because those two forms of media and technology simulation really do create levels of dopamine release in the brain that are similar to the release of dopamine with its, uh, kind of with the use of <laughs> speed or meth. I mean, it literally is very, very addictive in terms of neurological processing. Okay, we're going to fly through the impacts on relationships. I promise it will be quick, and then I'm going to give you like a really expansive two or three minute break, um, and then we'll come back. This uh, next little video shows the, what I think uh, the story of how relationships are changing. what we how we imagine them doing um, I, I've had that happen a lot I've had some really kind of incredible successes with this book and so people will say to me like things are going so well for you and I'm thinking like you have no idea how things are going for me I'm actually kind of a nervous wreck these days but you know but again we rely on the data that we get in these spaces rather than relying on these embodied experiences and it's a lot easier to just check somebody's feed right than to pick up the phone or to check in there are some incredible things that technology does this is an app that a high schooler made where you can uh, find someone to sit with at lunch which is an incredibly intimidating thing when your kids come home and say like i can't figure out who to sit with i dare you all to go to a school you don't know anybody in and go in the lunchroom it is intimidating as all get out um so there are some incredible things that technology can do but overall, if you look at what's happening and, and the self-report, especially the research that includes self-report of middle and high schoolers, this is what they're experiencing in the world of relationships. They experience that there's kind of this decreased empathy from amongst their peers, that they don't really know if their peers are interested in them as much as they you know, maybe would have reported in the past. But there's kind of this indifference in relation to others and kind of a hyper-focus on like, how am I presenting myself? How am I in the world? I would call this like a soft narcissism. And this can oftentimes result from the fact that there's no longer any sense of moderated intimacy. We just now, people research each other on the click of a button, right? You know, so you probably, if you knew I was coming, you looked me up to see if I was worth my weight in salt before you came, you know, and students or kids on dorm floors, this happens all the time. They look each other up and they come to their first meeting with each other with all kinds of preconceived ideas based on how those people have presented themselves online. And what often happens is most of us curate a sense of ourselves online, right? We're not presenting all the awards we didn't win or all the, the you know, all the photos with the 18 shins. Um, and so we've got this person, kind of person out there, but then when we go to interact with people in embodied spaces, we know we might be letting them down and that creates this kind of anxiety. 
We also are living in a time where we don't have to, again, Laura Ingalls just kind of had to get along with whoever happened to be on the trail that day. Anymore, we don't have to find ways of getting along with the people that we bump into all the time because we can create more shock for our own kind of relational um, identity. In communities like ours, and I, I looked last night, there is a very active Hot or Not presence, Hot or Not, After School, Yik Yak. These are all GPS lo uh, location-based apps. And these are places where you will get lists like fattest girls at Lake Ridge Junior High or best blow jobs at Lake Ridge High School. These are real things that are on there. Um, and these are places where students are oftentimes evaluating each other. And when a student knows they have been named in one of these places, they are often terrified to go to their parents. They're feeling all the relational hate of, of kind of being bullied, but they're scared to go to their parents to talk about it because they know their parents will do a couple of things. One will be like, well, what are you doing on that site? Or, well, I'm calling Mr. such and such. You know, they'll overreact or they will shame them. So I bring this up because we need to know that we are raising children in a culture where they are constantly being evaluated. Um, the swipe right phenomenon is from Tinder, which is, you know, you're, it's a dating app and you're fed an ever never ending stream of faces and you swipe right on those that you like and you swipe left on those that you don't like the look of and whoever swipes right on you and you on them, you match. That you know, seems benign that we wouldn't have to think about that at middle school. But last year, and then this year, we had even more universities on both, on both uh, coasts went to a Tinder-like version of choosing roommates. So when you get your university application now, you get fed this constant stream. All it is is a picture and one sentence, and you swipe left or right. And imagine if you're the student who doesn't get swiped right on. I mean, this is really, really a really tricky reality that we are um, you know, launching our kids into. There's also this ambient sense of missing out all the time, this fear of missing out. And oftentimes what students will say to me is that when they bring it up to their parents, their parents will kind of either, you know, we feel uncomfortable. We don't want our kids to miss out, right? So when they come to us and they feel sad, we want to help them feel better rather than what I think they really need because they're going to live there. This is only going to get more of a truth for them where they are constantly exposed to the things that they feel like they don't measure up in or that they're not being invited to is to sink down onto the floor with them and just say like, this is impossibly painful. This is so hard to live in a time where you have to watch your friends having fun and you aren't invited. How can I help you live through this? How can we get through this together? This is the only chance we have you guys at getting our kids through what they are going to have to get through. Um, they are faced all the time with people who are using online platforms to have relationships kind of in this performance art way that will make other people feel less than. And we need to kind of help our children know how to be discerning and how to deal with their feelings. And the only hope they have of being able to deal with their feelings is if you can handle their strong feelings. Um, I just want to make one last comment, and that is that more and more your children are going to have the opportunity to not even have to need to have embodied relationships, but just to have all kinds of relationships either online or with devices. There's some new research that shows that families that have an iHome or an Alexa device have kids who are much more commonly now saying things like, hey, mom, like, hey, Siri, right? Um, <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> but when you literally have a device that you can just ask to do things for you rather than needing to move around, or you have a device that knows you better than anyone else, so it feeds you more and more of what you want, that can become a real closed loop where I no longer feel like I need to go out and know how to interact with people in embodied spaces. And so you do our kids a disservice when we don't help them with that. So some interventions are just to make sure that we are all keeping our interpersonal skills in tune. For every 10 texts you send, maybe make a call. Um, take it upon yourself to have eye contact with people of all ages and to, to let your kids watch you talk with people about important things and let them watch you and encourage them to learn how to talk about nothing at all. People who are interviewing high school and college students for summer jobs will tell you, kids no longer have the ability to do what they call schmoozing, you know, talking about absolutely nothing. Instead, it's this like awkward thing and then we're down on our phones immediately rather than staying connected. So keeping those skills in tune, watching the way that we talk about others. One thing that is really clear in the literature is that anytime a screen is involved in a family kind of entertainment gathering, the talk goes snarky and critical pretty quickly. 
whether it's about the reps or the dresses or the whatever. So watching the way that we talk about people and, in, and, and beginning to come toward that rather than in shaming or criticizing or judging ways, how can we start talking about um, kind of inclusivity and empathy? Um, the rest of these we're going to talk about in the second half. So I'm literally going to give you guys like a three minute break because I'm so kind that way. Um, you might want to come up and look at these are just toys that can and come play with them. Like come interact with them, do your thing in three minutes. I'm just going to start talking. Get some fresh air if you need.
This is harder and harder because everything they search for creates a stronger algorithm. And the thing that we have a thought about as parents is we start their algorithm when we start tagging them in social media sites. So there was an article in the Atlantic a couple of months ago about the rite of passage when a six to eight year old searches himself on Google and finds all the horrific pictures and things their kids, their parents have posted about them. And that that has already created an algorithm for them. And that not just that, but they create algorithms when they like, if they have a big, a, an older sibling who they hear, you know, talking about something and they search that, or they're just curious about what is, I don't know, whatever, they're, what is sex, I don't, whatever they search for, it literally creates strong algorithm marks that follow them. And this is a huge issue for adolescents who go through a period of being really curious about sex or really curious about things like eating disorder <clears throat> tips or even self-harm tips where when they get help and they maybe move away from those proclivities, they're still constantly fed websites and things because they're in keeping with their algorithm. And that's where we as parents need to help them navigate how to kind of respond. It used to be that we could, you know, just apply filters, but now I really believe after doing this research for this long, we can't expect filters to protect our kids. And we can't just set time limits and expect that to protect our kids. We have to get much more in the weeds, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, basically, I just want to say that we need to teach our kids. We, we're very worried about helping them know how to promote themselves online, what not to share, what to share, setting time limits. But if we aren't at the same time teaching them how to think about themselves, how to be with themselves, how to like who they genuinely are, then we are really going to miss the opportunity to launch them into the world in such a way that they can maintain a sense of personal agency and sense of self in a world that is going to increasingly be confronting them with opportunities for connection with artificial intelligence and other forms of technology. I think about this as a, so a locus, you know, loci is the center. It's not really a grasshopper, but it's my very weak attempt at a joke. We want to have the center of our feelings about ourselves be in us, not in the number of likes we get or the number of, of levels we have passed in a game. And so we need to model for our children having a very strong internal locus of control and then help them have that as well so that they can have the grit to handle and to tolerate the kinds of difficulties and, and, and frustrations they're going to experience. And one of the difficulties they're going to experience when you guys go home tonight is that you're going to ask them to be inconvenienced, uncomfortable, and bored, right? And I'm going to ask you guys to do the same. That unless we all commit to being uncomfortable, totally inconvenienced, like some of the time just actually going to the store and buying something instead of having Amazon deliver the 18th box of the day, right? Unless we are willing to do that, we will just stay at this dysregulated state that we kind of are currently living in based on so much stimulation. And we don't know how to soothe ourselves. We have really, in America, I believe, lost the lie that our technology soothes us. You know, at the end of a long day, we want to binge on a season of something on Netflix or sit on Pinterest for eight hours or play a video game. But in reality, those things actually create dysregulation in our physiology in such a way that we are not soothed. And so that's where we're going to spend the whole rest of our time after we very quickly talk about. So in terms of digital interventions um, uh, regarding how to maintain a sense of self in a digital world, we want to keep technology out in the open. You know, when I was growing up, uh, we had one television. It was in the family room. And if I was going to watch the show that I wasn't supposed to watch, which at my house was The Love Boat, <laughs> my dad called it Smut Barge. <laughs> And then the discipline was that he and I were going to have to have a sit-down conversation about why this was not edifying to my personal development and why sex was more, you know, it was more than just getting on a cruise ship and it was just ridiculous. And it was very highly motivating not to do that. Now we have, you know, access to these tiny screens that we take everywhere with us. And our children are, are watching and seeing things outside of the purview of our wisdom to help them be discerning. So really thinking about keeping technology out in the open, maybe making earbuds a privilege so that you actually know what is going on. Um, we're going to do all these things in the next little bit. Behavioral interventions, we really, I cannot stress strongly enough, most of us grown people are at the risk of having our locus of control of our feelings about ourselves outside of ourselves. And so we really need to dial this in. We need to be able to handle and tolerate our own failures. We need to make just stupid, awkward mistakes and live through them in front of our kids. 
We need to be bored out of our brains and invite our kids into that. We need to teach self-soothing. And then we need to kind of think about focus, delay, and regulation, which we're going to talk about. That's that FDR. Oh, yeah, well, I'll talk about that later. Okay. So now the whole rest of our time, we're just going to talk about what we do about this. Because that's the reality that we live in. And technology is not going anywhere. In fact, it's only going to become more and more a part of our lives. You guys seen the new refrigerators now that have cameras inside them? So when you're in the store, you can dial into your fridge and see what's in the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> Which then creates a whole secondary uh, need for, now we've got a, literally a whole line of industry and technology that is uh, safety around refrigerator digital connections. Anyway, whatever. Okay. Anyone here from Kansas? Oh, shoot. <laughs> it is beautiful in all ways. However, it is a little sepia, right? Like, you go to Kansas and you realize that there's a reason that Dorothy was quite taken by Oz. And there is a reason that we are all quite taken by technology. Oftentimes because we've gotten sutter lazy and our lives have become sort of sepia outside of the wild and interesting things that we do with technology. And I believe that as humans, we are given this kind of insatiable hunger for experience and also this incredible potential for experience, but we so often don't expand that. We just kind of take the, the path of least resistance. And we just, you know, we know we can have exciting experiences of playing the fifth hour of Candy Crush. So we just do that rather than getting out the Parcheesi board. I don't know what Parcheesi has as a person. Um, anyway, when I was first starting thinking about this, this was like 15 years ago, and um, I was constantly on a rant because I was constantly figuring out some new thing that was going to be horrible. So my kids were in middle school when flip phones came out. My husband was on the team that was creating the chip for the first iPhone. So I was watching how like middle school connections were getting disrupted by everyone looking down at their phone and then hearing what phones were about to bring to us. And so I started, you know, just getting really into the research, and I was constantly a big fat bummer to be around. So my kids decided this one night we're going to have like a powered off night, and they got out my old box of life magazines, and you know, they were like, we're going to just think about the old days, mom, and it's going to be really good. And within about five minutes, I was on a big rant because every ad was an ad like this one that said, this glass of tang is better for you than an actual orange. This one says anything fried in Western oil is more healthful. And then there were ads like this saying it's never too early to start your child on 7-Up, right? <laughs> what happened in post-World War II America is, you know, we suddenly didn't have to kind of, we weren't having to be as careful with our resources, and we now could take this, this great thing that we had figured out how to can food, and now we can lace it with all these, ball, you know, kind of faint colors and tons of salt to make it taste amazing, and all you had to do was open a can. You didn't have to, you know, do anything anymore. Just pop it in the, the pot and put it on the stove. And we really did take this thing that was, I think, intended to be a side dish and turn it into a main course. It became what we started eating over time, right? And 10 to 15 years later, what do we find? Hypertension, obesity, high cholesterol literally entered the picture in America. So then the government just put out the food pyramid and it solved everything, right? <laughs> Not so much. We really are still trying to come back from the really profound physiological health effect of eating so many preservatives and eating in such kind of thoughtless ways. We're still trying to come back from that now. And I believe that this is true of technology. Things I was talking about 10 years ago that people said, you're just a doomsdayer, are now happening pretty regularly. People, you know, call it, there, I, I have yet to go to a college where there aren't at least three students who have, have had a chip enabled in, under their skin. So they are now chipped. And they use that to turn on lights in their room, to contact people when they're getting nearby. They use it as their credit card to pay for things. This is just a part of where we are. And it's up to us to make sure that the context our kids are, are growing up in is not only so, so bereft of excitement that they just passively gravitate toward more and more technology. So there are some things we can do. I have gone through these slides and highlighted the things that I think are the really important things. And again, they're all listed on um, in my website with links to a lot of ideas how to do them. In the book, there are, there are whole chapters on how to think about who your child is and what your child gravitates toward 
like if your child gravitates towards strategy games, then you might want to really load your home filled with embodied resources that, that engage strategy in this way, like things like, let me come over here. Well, we'll get to them. Okay, the first thing you can do is tell yourself the truth. So if you guys go home and just smack talk your children and don't own the fact that you have some kind of blind spots yourself, it will go poorly. <laughs> so we need to really, you know, commit ourselves to, to, to being clear about the fact that we have also developed habits. Um, we also need to tell ourselves the truth about marketing. So I, I skipped through a slide called the hidden curriculum, but if you look at any marketing website right now, or if you are in marketing, the hidden curriculum is all anybody is talking about. And the hidden curriculum is just how can we keep people connected to our site 24 hours a day. That's why we're seeing Facebook now, you can send money, you can have you know Snapchat-like interactions there, same thing in Instagram, same thing in WhatsApp. Everyone's wanting to keep us in their site longer because that gives them access to more of our information, which gives them access to more money. <laughs> and, and that's okay, everyone needs to make a living, but it's up to us to make sure that we are honest with ourselves about that. That it isn't just benign. This is especially happening for children because children right now who are in sixth through uh, twelfth grade are considered to be that they will they are going to change the market economy in a way no other generation has. So there's a real push to get this hidden curriculum of attaching kids to certain sites and to certain ways of marketing earlier, and we need to push against that. So a lot of even you know brick and mortar stores are now creating apps and things that they want you to download, and you get special features if you're on the app when you're in the brick and mortar store. You see how that kind of creates this double reality that we're kind of you know weakening the embodied experience because you can have a more, and that, that's kind of what um, augmented reality does. You know, it makes the embodied experience seem more exciting because of technology. Um, we need to think about, and you are doing that by being here tonight, we need to think about ways of literally assessing tech use and, and, and asking about the pools that your kids are swimming in. One of the best ways you can do that is by talking to other parents. So look around this room, see who's here, and start some conversations about where are the places that Lake Ridge Junior High students are spending their time online, and what can we do to make some embodied experiences that might make, make it be a muse to leave some of that technology for to moderate their use. Um, we need to talk honestly about um, the fact that kids now are expected to be online a lot. They have to be online to sub submit papers and to, to, you know, I mean, especially in communities like ours where there are high expectations with grades, you know, they are sometimes checking their grades and panicking in the middle of the day online. We need to talk with them about this and like how can we live in this world but also help you with the feelings that it creates. Um, this is true for grades, it's true for body expectations, eating disorders are on the rise, both for boys and girls, and so we really do need to be honest about that. In terms of assessing, I've, I've come up with this easy little assessment method. I'm not sure why I moved this, because now I'm all disoriented. Very sorry. It's been a very long day. Three, three assemblies of middle schoolers. You guys, I will tell you, your middle school teachers are not paid enough. And they are rock stars. And your principal totally saved me because I was, yeah, anyway, here's a half off to y'all. Okay, so this is usually what happens in the first 10 years by doing this work. I would do like a six hour talk, I'm not kidding, or a three hour talk. And the first question would always be, well, how much time should my eight year old spend online? It's like, did you not hear me? So I came up with a way of talking about this because time is only one element. And I'm sure some of you saw that the American Academy of Pediatrics actually took away the time limits two years ago. And people were like, what? Does that mean now we're saying that it's okay for kids to be online? No, what it means is that if we only give you a guideline, you get too lazy as a parent. If we say 30 minutes, then you go like, okay, 30 minutes, as long as it's 30 minutes, but it must be fine. When in reality, if that 30 minutes is spent with highly violent porn, Oh, that's so great, right? So here's what we're going to do. And uh, this, I just use a hand model. I, I oftentimes wrap. I'm not going to make you live through that tonight. Um, it's just an A, B, C, D, and then a T. So the A is just you, and, and what in the book, but you could also do this just at home. You can just write the letters across the top of a page and then make a column or a row for each person in your family and literally just rate how each person is doing in that category. Within the next few months, this will hopefully be on my website. I'm in a weird space right now where my publisher owns my stuff and I don't, so I can't put it there until another few months. But um, we'll go back to this one. So basically, um, this is A. So you're just assessing.
thinking about what is my or my child's ability to focus, to delay, and to regulate. So focus, when I was in graduate school, we were looking at can a child focus on a task without being distracted for something like 12 to 15 minutes. Research now, 27 years later, is asking can a child focus on one thing without being distracted for 20 seconds? That's how much, that's how little we are expecting now of focus with children. So can we focus, can we hear a text come in and not check it? Can we, um, can we keep writing uh, our paper and not check the direct message that came in? So that's focus. Delay is, can I have a thought and kind of set it aside, you know, can I think, you know, in the old days, when, you know, the old days, uh, when I used to go cruising, um, in Vanessa, California, where there was a lot of cruising, and uh, if you hear a song, you know, and you go like, oh, who sang that song, and you literally have to kind of delay knowing, which forced your brain to wire that prefrontal cortex. Now you're sitting at dinner, you want to know something, everybody grabs their phone and Googles it, right? So can you not Google it? And then can you regulate? And regulating just means when you feel dysregulated or when you feel uncomfortable in any way, can you actually soothe yourself without a scream? Can you bring yourself to a state of calm? So A, B, this finger just means, what is my attachment balance? Do I have some attachments in my embodied space and some attachments in digital spaces? We probably need to have some of both now. It would be irresponsible for us to raise kids outside of technology altogether because they need how to learn how to use it, just like they need to learn how to use everything else. So that's the attachment balance. This finger, I always tell students this would get me in a lot of trouble if I raised it by itself, right? Um, this is content and context. Context just means, am I constantly turning myself away from the context of others in order to look down at my device? So am I isolating myself, and am I doing that repeatedly? Content has to do with what am I consuming on these screens. Again, you know, if, if I am consuming uh, information about how to cure Ebola, 18 hours, go for it. If I'm watching gonzo porn, 18 minutes or seconds could create a lot of really difficult cognitive things for me to go through in the next while. D is just, in our, in our culture, this is a, a ring finger and it can show devotion. This is just, what is your devotion to your device? If you happen to leave your device at home one day, do you know one person's phone number that you could use to call on someone else's phone? Do you know one phone number by heart? How many people know three phone numbers by heart? That's the measure for early onset dementia, so good job, y'all. <laughs> Um, but it's becoming less and less the case. You know, this also has to do with, can you go to a movie without reading six reviews? Can you go into a restaurant? I really honestly believe that we all should just be willing to sometimes just get a radical case of food poisoning just to keep going in our ability to sometimes be spontaneous. You know, literally, just go into the restaurant that kind of looks cool that you want to check out rather than standing there and reading 18 Yelp reviews and then looking at urban food. You know, literally, we sometimes need to trust ourselves, not our devices. And then finally, we look at all four of those domains and then look at time. Again, um, a, a couple things I will tell you about time. Bill Gates and um, um, Steve Jobs both limited their kids all the way through high school to 30 minutes of entertainment time on screens a day. That says something to me. The other thing that I think is really interesting, and many of you maybe saw this, they, they did an expose um, in the Washington Post, and I was so excited because I've been saying this statistic for a while, but it's always great if you like get it reinforced so you know it's really true. Um, the, the highest number of Waldorf schools per capita, which Waldorf is the only school system in the U.S. that does not integrate technology until high school, and then only moderately. And the highest number per capita of Waldorf schools we have in our country is in Silicon Valley. And the waiting lists are something like four years long. And Silicon Valley is where all the creators of all of our technology have their kids in school. And that is very interesting to me, that the people who are creating this want their kids in learning environments without it. Um, so again, think about time in relation to all the other things. This is a way that you can kind of think that through. Okay, then I want us to think about, just like that food pyramid was intended to help us eat more healthy, to help us kind of manage some of the health effects of not eating well, we can think about a tech pyramid. And one of the ways that people have thought about, you know, trying to moderate use is oftentimes with, with contract or with, or with filters, you know, like, so we're going to put all these filters on 
just like, I'm going to only fill my fridge with organic carrots. And my child will never sneak to 7-Eleven and get a whole backpack full of Milky Ways, right? Um, so the problem with these ways of thinking is that anymore, unless you are applying filters and updating them every single week at all of these levels, you probably are not going to have effective filters. And to be honest, I don't think it's possible to keep up with filters anymore. Literally, if you miss one of those places, <laughs> stuff just comes in. And so I think far more importantly than, than creating filters, it's that we have to have start having these very difficult, very complex conversations far earlier than you think. That is probably the number one thing from parents is like, I should have listened to people who told me I needed to talk about porn before fifth grade, or I should have listened, you know. We have to start these conversations earlier than we think because your kids are going to be exposed to things. Now, you can set some things up. You can set up media contracts that, that will hopefully help. I think if you're going to check your child's devices, it is only fair that you do that with their awareness, that you say, I'm going to check your device. I'm either going to spot check it and you don't know when, or I'm going to check it every Wednesday. I think that is the fair thing. I am personally not a believer in giving children phones. Um, I am a big supporter and I have now several target families who are kind of doing research with me on having a bulk or a bank of family phones. And at middle school or high school, whenever you decide to give a phone, your child gets to access to one of the family phones. Um, if you give them their own device and then you use that as discipline and take it away all the time, that feels really confusing. Whereas if you have, if you are using a family device and you're learning how to use it in concert with our family guidelines and in keeping with our, you know, the, the agreements that we make, then it makes a little more sense that you can um, use it in those also in those disciplining ways. Um, but basically, the, the technology pyramid just says, in our family, we are going to basically try to endeavor to use technologies that connect us and technologies that educate us more and use technologies that entertain a little less, and then hopefully in most families, we don't even have to have those technologies that hurt, which are violent. And violence in, in media is super, it's, it's very clear that it has a pretty negative effect. Um, up until recently, there has not been research that shows that it's correlated with criminal forms of violence, but it is so highly correlated with soft forms of violence and relational aggression that I would prefer it not be on there at all. But most families have this flipped, where it's technologies that entertain get used a lot, like we're just binging on YouTube all the time, right? Um, rather than thinking about high quality content that educates, or things like FaceTime or Skype, or things where you're actually connecting with people. Um, this is just a way of, of thinking about it that it also will, if you keep checking my website, it'll be up there eventually. Above all else, if you can think about high quality content. So YouTube is not high quality content typically, right? And it's where a lot of us spend time. But if higher quality content usually is slower moving. It's less likely to it stimulate the release of dopamine in the brain. Um, we also want to think about if we can uh, harness our technology use and even the poor quality content content that we use for learning something. So if you are going to be on YouTube thinking about that, that uh, technology pyramid, then using YouTube to educate. So like right now, if you go into any like um, Squarespace in Portland, anybody here work in Squarespace in Portland, they have a whole Kendama crew and they learn a new trick every week on YouTube and it, it looks something like this. This is a Kendama. And literally, if you walk around, they all have them around their necks. There's one up here. Um, uh, but using, you know, using the medium to learn something is much better than just using it to consume. Um, the best apps and games, sadly, we aren't going to have a lot of time to go into this. But basically, there are two. Anybody know the work of Carol Dweck? There are two kinds of mindsets. There's a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. The fixed mindset says you hit a certain level, so like you hit a certain salary and you've arrived, or you hit a certain grade and then you're smart. Um, and that actually shows in the research that that taps us out of our potential earlier. We don't try as hard, we don't have grit, we don't have resilience, we're scared of failures when we're brought up or raised in that kind of a model. A growth mindset model says taking small risks and failing at them actually is helpful to us. That's part of learning, that we learn grit and we learn resilience in that way. So you want apps and games that, that use that growth mindset model rather than, you know, if you don't hit this level and you shut the computer off, 
you have to start all the way over. That's a fixed mindset model. And that, so at LAN parties, what used to be LAN parties where people would bring their game, their gaming equipment and game together for 48 hours, now at video game tournaments, I'm not joking you, Depends usually has a booth at the competition what? because people don't want to stop gaming because they'll lose all their, you know, they'll lose all their uh, performance. So literally, we want to be thinking about uh, these kinds of things. Um, everybody always asks me about mindfulness apps. My answer about mindfulness apps is, how about we all meditate without our phones? Right, um, but if you if you really want to use one to start getting you kind of more or your child more used to kind of some self soothing techniques, these are the ones that I um, suggest. Um, we want to teach discernment skills because more and more, and I, I'm sure some of you have seen this. This is a lot in the press right now. We are just coming to a reality where videos can be faked, where interviews can be faked. You know, people can use your voice, can use data. This is a fantastic resource. Everyone should have it on their phone in the next two years. I feel like it's out of Columbia University's Tau Center for Digital Journalism. It's emergent. You can type in any claim, and it will tell you if it's been verified or not and how to get more information about it. And it can be really helpful for thinking about deep, critical thought. So again, it's called emergent. Um, and it's also, I also have a resource page on my website that I'll be sending really So talk, honestly, like we talked about before, about the fear of missing out and about objectification. So body, consciousness, talk with your kids about they're sometimes going to know they missed out on things and that you understand that that's hard and that you can be a resource for them. We also have to think about the fact that, and prepare our kids, that content creators, especially on YouTube, and Twitch, everybody know about Twitch? Twitch is a game your students you know other learn game, they can get tips. It is it's quickly becoming almost more of you than YouTube. Um, in these spaces, people are doing more and more extreme things to garner audiences. So your kids are going to be exposed to things that you uh, that they may be hesitant to come to you about. This is one of the most popular YouTubers for high schoolers, and he actually in a live blog uh, a broadcast of recent suicide a hanging in Japan. And it was up for several hours before it was taken down. Um, we also have people on Twitch who are trying to get a large following by doing things like 24 to 48 hour game streams. And they get people to watch because they're doing these extremely long game streams. But now we've had two deaths of cardiac arrest and several other people hospitalized at extreme points in their feed um, because they just aren't taking care of themselves. So again, we need to, to prepare our kids. If any of you have girls who are gamers, please, 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 please talk with them regularly and consistently about the horrible treatment they are likely getting. Last year at South by Southwest, they were going to have a panel, Women in Gaming, and the women and the moderator received so many death threats prior to South by Southwest that they canceled the panel and they assigned them all a, a security detail during the actual conference. It is such a horrific place. And I hear this from young women on college campuses a lot, that they have been um, subject to really, really horrible treatment in their video game contexts that they haven't felt like they could talk to anybody about because they felt like that they would just get shut out of their gaming by their parents. Um, we need to think about breaking habits. It's always easier to break bad habits than it is, um, I mean, I'm sorry, it's always easier to set healthy norms than it is to break bad habits. Ask somebody you know, who's a smoker, would it be easier to never start or to try to stop? And they will tell you never start, right? Most of us have already habituated to high levels of tech use. So if you're going to go home and take this to, to make some changes, you're going to need to know that it's going to be hard. There is no nicotine patch for you know, limiting and moderating your tech use. And it's going to be challenging. And especially for our kids, our children have grown to have their technology use be a major support of their life. It's a major place where they get... Um, social support, it's a place where they get information, and if we just go in and yank that away from them, either for disciplinary reasons or because of what you've learned tonight, it's like taking the support of a bridge out. Part of their lives will crumble. We have to do this with great wisdom and with great kind of um, negotiation skills together. I think a lot of kids really, really stu suffer and struggle when they live in homes where the device is just either taken or then rewarded back. It has to be much more difficult and subtle than that. As you're trying to moderate, any of you who have the new iOS with Mac, you get your weekly usage statistics. Do those shock you a little bit? Yes. Whew, it's a little bit convicting, right? Uh, before that, this app was one of my favorites that it will send you a report every day. There are also apps like this that you and your children can use. You can even set your router at home to just go off at eight at night or go off at nine at night 
or to have a rotating password and that they can't get the password to the internet until they show you their completed homework. Or you can use something like this where you decide together, this one is called flipped off, and it literally shuts you out of the internet for a certain amount of time and then texts you a code to get back in. And I've had even computer science college students not be able to hack through it. Um, you have to work for buy-in with this. You can't just go in and say, here's our new family agreement about technology. We have to do this. And again, I wish I could tell you it, it was like that and it was easy. But it has to be all these messy, difficult conversations, all this really difficult habit breaking. <laughs> and when you're trying to break the habit, you have to be willing to be inconvenienced and uncomfortable and do things with your kids that are maybe a real pain in the butt. <laughs> like, right? You're going to have to offer them more kind of rich experiences. Um, we do need to have places where we as parents can kind of keep informed about what's going on because it changes every week. Uh, these are the places that I would encourage you to have um, on your phone or your device. Common Sense Media is especially fantastic. A couple of years ago, well, I don't have time to go into that story, but basically one of the things I love about Common Sense Media is you can go in and say, my child loves strategy or my child loves really rich visuals that happen to be violent. What are some games that are super strategic that aren't violent? Or, you know, we can really give you some great alternatives. I try to post the most research and all the videos and things that I use, which you're not getting to see most of those because you don't have six hours. But if you want fun videos to use for teaching tools, those are all on my uh, website. That's Not Cool is a fantastic place to start talking about digital literacy as a family, especially communication in online spaces and possible bullying. Fighting Drugs is a great resource for porn. And then uh, depression, suicidality, and self-harm are um, big, big, big common searches for individuals in our geographic area at the age of middle school and high school. And uh, to write well on her arms is what that last one is a, uh, an acronym for, and it's a fantastic resource. Um, we talked about WhatsApp. Uh, being aware that, you know, just checking history is, you can check history and say like, oh, everything's great. Not really so much anymore. Because if your kids use apps like WhatsApp and Kids, which most do now, they have search engines within them that only show up in the history bar as WhatsApp, not what they've searched within WhatsApp, right? So again, this is not me saying police your kids more. This is me saying have hard conversations and be the kind of parent that your child can actually come to. So you say to them things like, you're going to come across things online that are going to make you feel so weird so excited and you can totally come to me and I won't freak out and then you have to keep that promise and not freak out you know go in your car later and scream and cry and whatever but but we actually have to have these conversations more than we just need to please now oh. okay so this is just a, a, an example of how to have a non-shaming conversation because people always say what do you mean so when I when I kids when my son was in uh, high school I drove carpool and I really wanted to be the cool mom in the mornings so I've got like five 14-year-olds, you know, at 7.30 in the morning, not a happy time, as you all know. And I, I just I decided, you guys can pick the music, and we'll listen to your music on the way to school. Well, on day four, I was so depressed every day when they would leave, and I had the F word just like flying through my head. I'm like, this is not working for me. So rather than just coming to them and saying, like, this is, you know, your, whatever you put in your brain stays in your brain, and blah, 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 and have them not pay any attention. I said, we're going to change things up a little bit. You guys get to listen to your music until we are three minutes away from school, and then I get to pick. And the first day, I chose this song. <laughs> Regulated, and then we need to teach them what it feels like to be regulated. A glitter ball is a great thing. You can say when you're dysregulated, your feelings feel like this, and now we just need to sit still and breathe long enough until the glitter falls. Um, 
Okay. This is what you're being told over and over. You know, just put your put yourself in front of your screen and you'll feel soothed. It does not soothe you. Now, if you put 80% of Americans in a small room with no stimulation and you tell them you can sit there for 10 minutes with no stimulation, or you can choose a little box over here to apply low level shocks to yourself, 80% of people will apply low level shocks. <laughs> we <laughs> have to, to raise children who will sit in that room and not shock themselves, right? But this only happens when we teach how to have internal levels of control, how to have quiet moments. How to have 10 minutes, and the research just keeps coming up with benefits of 10 minutes a day of boredom. 10 minutes a day of boredom increases creativity. It actually, 10 minutes a day of boredom actually doubles the gray matter in the prefrontal cortex. 10 minutes a day doubles the gray matter in that part of the brain that we are diminishing with tattoos. Now we have new research that I haven't even gotten to include yet that we know that it also doubles the myelinization of the brain in that region of the brain. That means that the power and the efficiency of the brain are benefited and maybe even repaired by just 10 minutes. But this has to be practiced, and that's the tricky thing. So today, you know, I'm telling all these middle schoolers, you've got to practice 10 minutes of silence a day. If, even you, if I told you go be to silent for 10 minutes, today, it's very difficult, right? So we have to practice this. So we literally need to think about ways of teaching our kids how to assume a posture that's restful. Literally, maybe that's standing and thinking about roots growing out of your feet, or maybe it's lying on the ground. We need to teach them how to breathe, and then we need to teach them how to create moments that are just for being. There are some simple ways that to do this somewhere in this room. There's a Hoberman sphere, and it, can you just hold it up? So, like teaching your kids, when you inhale, breathe in through the nose, and the belly gets big, and then the belly drops down. So try that together. Inhale through your nose, and your belly gets big. Drops down. And having these around your house so that when somebody needs a breath, you just act it at them, right? Um, teaching your children to melt like ice. That literally to tense every muscle in their body, and that's what dysregulation feels like. And then to imagine the sun beating down on them and them melting from the top of their head, drips coming off their fingers and their toes. We have an amazing, uh, anybody know about Yoga Calm? They actually live in Portland. It's an international program. It's amazing. They teach kids regulation skills by teaching them Jedi skills. And when you go to Jedi school, everybody gets a lightsaber. And what do you do? The first day you learn how to use your lightsaber, which is like this. <sighs> which is what we just did, right? And on the last day of camp, you do it like a real Jedi in your mind. <laughs> and literally these things really can help having balance boards around for a while a couple months ago i had a little experiment in my house where you could only be on your cell phone if you were on a balance board and i had four or five kinds of balance boards and real quickly people put their phones away um, but anything you can do that can just bring us back to center physiologically that's why i have all these toys out and about Anything that you can offer that's kind of interesting and unique, um, even something like, I, I think every home should have a singing bowl. And, and actually, let me point this out too. So we tend to think about fidget toys that engage the mind. So we talk about things like Rubik's Cubes. Well, you have to engage your mind for that, and that is not boredom. So toys like this that just move in free-flowing ways that require no logic, no skill, right? That's the kind of thing you want. Things like this, things like meditation balls that you, my hands are too small, that I can't do this, no hope. You do this and you try to make them not make a clacking sound or things like this. And maybe one night at dinner, you just have all these things on the dinner table um, and you play with them. I think every home should have a singing bowl. And the reason is because it's a tangible and kinesthetic way of being calm and everyone before you leave i'll put this over there literally i'm not kidding everyone should ring it put it in your hand and ring it and you can feel the sound it goes all the way through right it takes about five minutes for the sound to die down and you feel it you hear it it's amazing i i sometimes and since i'm home i can tell you where to get these um i love tibetan spirit on hawthorne the guy makes it um, everyone should go by for tomorrow and then finally, um, we have no hope. We have no hope if we are not providing our kids embodied experiences that, that make it willing to put their technology down for. And so the thing that you can most do is to think about what are the creative ways that you can send a message that will speak to this lie that your kids hear every day. <laughs> Everything is awesome. 
Everything is cool when you're watching the screen. Everything is awesome when you share it on me. Feels on springs, just to name two awesome things. Of course, you don't show angry kings, you know it's awesome. Everything, apps that please, more selfies in the sours of the best TVs, brand new apps, shows to go. Awesome internet, that's super woe. Shows, pros, folks, the awesome games, flames, and ways that awesome. Everything you watch or send or share is awesome. Everything is awesome. Everything is cool when you're dancing in jeans. Everything is awesome when you're watching a screen. Xfinity. Everything is awesome. The future of awesome. I feel like that's sort of a lie. <laughs> I know that everything we share in Sea of Dreams is not awesome. Um, what I like to think about is that screens and our experiences in digital spaces can provide us with a sort of ambient feeling of an experience, right? So just like I could create a, a fire pit up here with construction paper, maybe with cellophane and a fan blowing on it, and I could have a little soundtrack playing of crackling wood, it would be super safe, right? No one's going to get burned. But we also wouldn't have any of the principles that make fire so wonderful, like the purifying forces in it, the, the, the ability that it has to, to um, warm us, the ability that it has to create a mood. And yet, um, it's really hard to think about exposing our kids to the fire that is real life, right? So I, I have tried to search for a group of people that understands fire well, and that group is as the group of, of the world of blacksmiths. And they know exactly what color the fire has to be to insert their the, whatever metal they work with into the fire to make it so that it's perfectly malleable. And the color palette that they think about is red, orange, yellow, white. And a blacksmith knows that if they put their metal in the fire when it's red and then pull it out and try to shape it, it won't, it won't be malleable enough. It, it, the fire isn't hot enough for it to do anything. It just kind of stays the same. They can actually injure themselves or hurt the tool. If they put the metal in when the fire is white, the metal just melts. It can't hold its, its composition because it's the, the fire is too hot. So that the, these metalsmiths and blacksmiths know to put the metal into the fire right when it is in this orange-yellow heat. Where the, where the fire brings out the things in the metal that, that can eventually be turned into their most beautiful potential, right? And I believe that we as parents and as grown people in this world have the responsibility of putting ourselves in our own orange-yellow heat and then helping our children navigate what is for them their orange-yellow heat. What are the embodied experiences that will just be edgy enough, just hot enough, for them to become genuinely more fully who they are. Because I, in this world, need your children. I need them. I need the uniqueness that is them. Your, maybe your child is going to cure cancer. Yours is going to write the next symphony and whatever. But I, we need them all. And so we have to create these environments. Environments like things like this. I've just collected some photos from people who have sent them to me, putting puzzles out and just seeing what happens when people come together. I create procrastination stations on college campuses where the whole goal is to spend nothing and bring as many art supplies as we can and people just make huge murals on walls with tape and magazines or, or what often happens is they'll take watercolor paint and I'll usually have some Elmer's glue and they'll paint it on their hand and it takes amazingly 10 minutes for it to dry. They can't do anything and then peel it off. Having Legos, just big huge bins of Legos under the coffee tables. Um, these shape blocks, which I have up here, are one of the most played with things at my house. Or a bowl of kinetic sand. You put a bowl of kinetic sand in the lap of the middle schooler and they start just talking to you because they don't even remember that they're talking to you because it's just so exciting and wonderfully um, kinesthetically stimulating. Aaron's Thinking Putty, uh, you can get this at a lot of bookstores. It's a fantastic one for stillness because if you put it on your hand and hold still, it will maintain its uh, structure, but it will kind of ooze and it's kind of a cool feeling and it, it inspires stillness. If your child literally just can't sit still and the, because of brain wiring or because of maybe a diagnostic issue, then have some ways in your home where they can fidget or move. It'll make you nuts when they're kind of playing with luna sticks and talking to you, but at least they're talking to you and get over yourself and let your child have what they need. Have a pull-up bar somewhere in the house where they can just, you know, have their conversations with them while they're doing pull-ups or hanging upside down. You can uh, bring spray paint and huge boards and let them, you know, just paint away. Any of you gone to a maker's fair? 
These, I think it is no small surprise that maker's fairs are the range as we are becoming more technological. So maker's fairs are just places where grown people and young people can come together and some people come to teach a skill and some people come to learn a skill. The last one I was at, there was everything from making a Lego robot to making a banana keyboard. And then by the door was a 90 year old man, this was in Charleston, South Carolina, and he was a, a duct taping bottle caps to people's shoes and then teaching them how to tap dance. <laughs> the dream. Um, let your kids busk sometime outside making music or find a really unique instrument for them to experiment with. The neurologists that I know say that the world would be a better place if we all did one of three things. Play ping pong, did bouldering, or drum. Like where you have to use different parts of your body in different ways. So find ways of doing that. Go to an Asian market and set a little timer and every five minutes just stop and take in all the sights and all the smells. Just, you know, really kind of immerse yourself into different experiences. I ask at college campuses, what is a way that motivates you to put your phone down during communal times? And they always say eating with their hands. So like eating a Mediterranean meal or eating an Indian meal where they can get their hands dirty. If your family is super into so you think you can dance, go take some lessons or go see live theater. Um, if you have somebody who's super into violence, take them to a live theatrical version of Hamlet. Everyone dies. <laughs> yes. And live theater is compelling. Um, in Portland, we have amazing um, improv resources. If you have a kiddo who's facing some social anxiety, improv can be an amazing place for them to playfully kind of work through that. My, my favorite places are comedy sports and deep end theater. Both have classes for middle school and high schoolers. Throw a theme party. This was a, I threw a reading rainbow party at a college. Someone came as the reading rainbow. Um, but you know, just get people involved in different ways. If you really need to include your tech, uh, do some geocaching. You can go to geocaching.com, get the coordinates, track them down, and then you end up you know, finding a cache at the end. This is something I love to do. These are my three favorite things. So I just love this is at Director's Park in Portland. I love to just go put a tablecloth on the table and put a game out or a puzzle out and just watch what happens. You will be amazed at how people stop and gather. Another fun thing is I like to have um, unit, unit dimensional, multi-dimensional, that's what I mean, not unidimensional, boredom parties with people of all ages. And this is something that came out of one of our boredom parties. So you don't, in a boredom party, you do not curate your invite list like you normally would of like, who can talk about these shared items? And who's gonna just, you know, network? No, you just invite a bunch of people. And the only thing is that nobody can come with a plan in mind. If somebody has something that they like to do when they're bored, like some colored pencils and a sketchbook, they can do that. Or maybe this one, everybody showed up and nobody had brought anything. So we're literally at my house and we're trying to figure out what to do. So I decided, hey, when I was a little kid, we did this thing called ice blocking. Let's go do it. So you find a park with hills after dark, you get ice blocks at 7-Eleven, and you go and you slide down the hills on the ice block. It is radically fun. Another one that we had where nobody brought anything, we ended up playing bigger and better. So we split up into four groups of three, and everybody got a penny, and they had to go to the neighbor's houses and say, like, I've got a penny, do you have something bigger or better? And we had to compete. And I ended up with a treadmill, a dresser, <laughs> and a king-sized bed frame. <laughs> anyway, so boredom parties is really just bringing people together of all ages. Maybe you have a useless skill night. That happened at one of our parties where everybody had to teach everyone else a useless skill. So, like, I taught the thriller dance, and somebody else taught, like, how to lick bottle caps, you know. But just times where you're coming together with the awkward moment of trying to decide together, what do we do? And then my final thing, when my kids were young, um, you know, everybody wanted to watch movies all night, and I would tell them, and this is, this, is, this is just illuminating how we have to be willing to be inconvenienced, uncomfortable, right? We have to be willing to do that so we can offer our kids these experiences. Um, I would tell them, you can watch a movie, and then we're going to put all the phones in a, bu a bucket. And here I have this list of all of your teachers' and administrators' addresses, and I have a trunk full of sidewalk chalk. And we are going to go from midnight to three in the morning and sidewalk chalk their driveways and their streets until we start seeing the sun. And then we're going to go have pancakes. In the middle. <coughs> now that's inconvenient, right? It's uncomfortable to stay up all night. But I now have, you know, young adults who come and sidewalk chalk my driveway. And if you go out to my car right now, you'll see I have sidewalk chalk there. I take it and like downtown Portland, I, I stand in my bathroom here and I'll just like draw a little welcome mat at people's cars mm -hmm. or, you know, just whatever to just kind of, again, invite people into this different way of embodying fun and play and having embodied experiences that connect us with ourselves and with each other. 
I have kept you three minutes too long. It's all long three minutes, right? Um, these are ways of uh, getting in touch with me. Um, Instagram I use as a way of trying to kind of um, encourage uh, putting your phone down and doing wild different things. Facebook I usually try to put research. Um, and I really thank you for your time. It's been really fun to be in my own home with people. <laughs> so thank you so much.